Well, it's great to be here in Stockholm. Uh, we're going to go uh, through a little bit of a journey uh, this afternoon after lunch. And I want to tell you a bit of a story. And it's a story of challenges. It's a story of a cast of characters, some that you know. Uh, and I think it's a story, uh, hopefully, of a new hope um, that uh, is uh, actually formed in a collaboration uh, with Prime Key and Vanify uh, as uh, we look to help solve problems uh, for a whole set, Dan mentioned Docker, a whole set of new problems uh, that, that we're going to be facing, uh, and we certainly already have been. So uh, let's get started on this journey. Um, first of all, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is uh, Kevin Bochick. I'm uh, Vice President of Strategy at uh, Venify, and I'm going to be joined in telling this story today by Hari Nair, uh, who's Head of Product Management. I'll talk first. I'll tell you the introduction. Hari is going to show you the really cool stuff at the end, uh, the Death Star, when it comes along. So before we get into that story, talking about A New Hope, let me just tell you first and just talk for just a few seconds uh, just about Venify. You may not be uh, familiar uh, with Venify. And we focus um, in a particular area that will be certainly a home to be known to you guys very well. But as we introduce to uh, new participants, we talk to new, um, new folks and introduce them to Venify, we focus uh, in on solving a problem, again, that you're involved in. And um, there's a set of problems we think in the world there are two actors. There are certainly people, and they may have usernames and passwords. And sometimes they do delegate things like certificates uh, on their behalf. And then there are machines. And whether that's uh, physical silicon, whether that's software that runs in the cloud or an application server or a container, uh, these are the future. And this is the space that Venify uh, focuses in. Um, this is the space of that we're going to be talking today that uses a whole set of identities. Things like code signing certificates, things like SSL TLS keys and certificates, things like SSH keys. And this is something that we're very fortunate at Venify. Uh, we help secure and protect uh, the world's largest banks, retailers, insurers, defense contractors, um, some of the world's largest, uh, um, uh, also uh, um, airlines as well. Some of you may have flown here. Uh, and we'll actually get to talk about that in a second. So that's just a bit of the introduction uh, to Venify. Har and I would love to talk to you more about Venify if you're interested. But let's now get back to our story. So let's start. <laughs> I said we were going to keep you awake, and that went fast because I want to make sure we get Tom to the end of the cool stuff. But there is a story. There is a challenge that we have as it's been with code signing. A whole bunch of new uh, team members are involved in code signing. It's spread like wildfire, and the bad guys uh, have gotten involved. And, of course, code signing, as you all know, is a very, very powerful force. But as I'll share with you in just a moment, it's also been turned uh, for bad. Are you all right? What's wrong? I felt a great disturbance in the force, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. I fear something terrible has happened. You better get on with your exercises. Yeah, so unfortunately, something very, very bad has happened. But... Before we get to the bad, let's get to the good. So back in the good old days, all right, when we were running, oh, actually, why didn't that play? Oh. Hmm, okay. Well, unfortunately, 
Yeah. Well, what I was going to introduce to you, that back in the good old days, before we actually had, uh, you know, mobile phones, smartphones, uh, app stores, you know, it was pretty easy to be able to tell the code that you were going to run. You could see it, you could touch it. Actually, I had here, and I guess the technology was incompatible. It was an old punch card system. I mean, you could see it, you could touch it, feel it. Um, but then some bad things happened, though, and some bad characters <laughs> came along the way. And I thought I'd, I'd introduce you to, I think, the really, really big event that as we think about running code, and why code signing became so important. It was a really pivotal event. And it goes back to 1995. Some of you may have been around then. And it looked much like uh, this. I mean, if we think about Windows, this really started a whole revolution of both you know, running a whole bunch of code. And you'll note here, I included a few bit of snippets from some other people who were involved in this revolution. Um, if you ever want to watch Bill Gates dance, you can do so on Google. You can find some amazing things. But they were really, really happy in 1995 with the launch of Windows 95. But unfortunately, though, of course, that started and spawned a whole new generation. First, really, I think, large-scale uh, malware. And there start to be then a lot of questions. So who developed what? I don't know. When was it developed? Is it malicious? Was it modified? These were problems uh, that we were faced. And then, fortunately, came along that powerful force. The solution, which was we could take an application, we could then digitally sign it. We could sign, seal it, so that we could start to answer those questions about who developed it, when was it developed, when was it modified. And, of course, it came along with some great attributes. We know not only who developed the application, who signed it, but also we could know that a third party actually said, yes, I received this, and I actually, again, signed it at such and such date and time. So, wow, this, this is an incredibly powerful force. And not only was it used for applications, it's used every time we boot up our laptops thousands and thousands of times as we boot up all the drivers and libraries come now digitally signed on OS X, on Windows, all of our mobile devices now, all the app stores, everything now, the, all the architectures today and to the future are all being built on the idea that I actually need to know who developed it, has it been modified, when was it digitally signed? Even things like, again, you may have flown on a big mobile device like this. You know, Boeing 787, the uh, A380, the A550, all part of a new generation of big mobile devices that just so happens to fly and all run signed code because they're just big, again, mobile devices that can affect uh, how fast they go and how high. Um, so, wow, code signing has come a very, very long way. And if you're not familiar, you've never used a variety of tools, and I'll show you in just a bit more about some of those tools. You know, what does actually kind of this, again, look like as your system runs? Again, you get to figure out uh, who developed uh, your application. Um, here you can see here who developed it. You get a nice set of uh, chaining up. Uh, various certificate authorities, so I know ultimately that whole chain down to who signed it. And then, as well, again, we have time stamping uh, involved here, so I know, again, when was it, uh, again, actually submitted to be, to be signed by, again, um, a third party. So this, wow, a very, very, very powerful force. What do bad guys do? Well, bad guys, again, like to use powerful forces, and they turn it to the dark side. And what we're starting to see, and actually if we go back to the blueprint of the ultimate blueprint and malware, the most effective malware, what have we seen? They've turned code signing in mass against us. 
Okay? So I thought I'd share with you a little bit about not just Star Wars, but how Hollywood now talks about how bad guys are using what we think is something that's a very powerful force for good, turning it against us. And it all goes back a few years, say seven years, back to Stuxnet. So let's see about how Hollywood talks about code signing, the misuse of code signing certificates, and its impact to the future. But this has the whiff of August 1945. Somebody just used a new weapon, and this weapon will not be put back into the box. Someone decided that we're going to create something new, something evolved, that's going to be far, far, far more aggressive. Um, and we're okay, frankly, with it spreading all over the world to innocent machines and in order to go after our target. In order to get low-level access to Microsoft Windows, Stuxnet needed to use a digital certificate, which certifies that this piece of code came from a particular company. Now, those attackers obviously couldn't go to Microsoft and say, hey, test our code out for us and give us a, a digital certificate. So they essentially stole them from two companies in Taiwan. It spread to any Windows machine in the entire world. You know, we had these organizations inside the United States who were in charge of industrial control facilities saying, we're infected, what's going to happen? We didn't know if there was a deadline coming up where this threat would trigger and suddenly it would like turn off all you know, electricity plants around the world or it would start shutting things down or launching some attack. What are the implications of the fact that we now are in a post-Stuxnet world? I do know this. If we go out and do something, most of the rest of the world now thinks that's a new standard and it's something that they now feel legitimated to do as well. All right, so that was a really, really powerful weapon in enabling Stuxnet to be successful for a certain period. And it set forth a blueprint. Because what do we see today? So we see in places, and you can go and track this yourself, in certain places like the CCSS form, we see page after page after page of stolen digital certificates sometimes fraudulently obtained, but mostly stolen, misused to enable malware, okay? And this, we can go back and we can see, and this is from McAfee from a bit earlier this year. There are now over about 23 million pieces of malware that are enabled with very, very valid digital certificates. And if you go back and you chart this, you go back to 2010, it was basically almost nothing, okay? So Stuxnet created a powerful blueprint. The bad guys now have been turned on to this to be able to distribute their malware, to try and trick antivirus, endpoint protection. I talked to some of the, 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 the teams in Silicon Valley that used to write antivirus software, and up to about two, three years ago, if you saw a co-signed application or driver, it didn't even get scanned. So this was really, really effective. And it's led some, like Intel, to conclude, you know what, hey, the next big marketplace, you want something really, really liquid asset, you want to be able to sell something fast and be very potent, wow, it's digital certificates. It is code signing certificates. And you know, here's just one example on a Russian-speaking marketplace of something that's worth a lot more than just any one of our individual identities, but it's the identification of an application, it's code. It's a code signing certificate. And in this case, this one was sold 10 times over. You get about $10,000 quick in just a matter of, of a day. So that is a very, very profitable business and uh, a very, very prof a powerful weapon. Now, there is some hope though here. So, of course, the, the CA Security Forum um, has put forth some guidance, I think recognizing some of the challenges and the inconsistencies that some CAs uh, had had in the past around uh, who are they giving code signing certificates to and how are they being used. So you might be aware, I've just summarized here some of the three big pieces of guidance. Might seem awfully, awfully simple or basic, but you know, again, secure your keys and an HSM. So that when you know, the NSA 
uh, or others come knocking, uh, you know what, they can't actually extract the keys. Um, and then CAs as well uh, now are revoking or taking certain procedures when notified to investigate of code, sign, uh, of code signing certificate misuse. Uh, and as well now CAs must provide a time stamping service. So these are in effect, uh, and Dan can confirm here, I think at least in effect since the 1st of February. Uh, of this year, and are definitely going to be an aid, okay, and helping uh, stop the misuse of code signing certificates. All right, so let's go on now to the next part of our journey. So we've seen how there's powerful force, how it's been turned a bit to the dark side. There is another wrinkle here in our story, which is, again, this this force is now meeting a new set of rebels that all they want to do is they just want to go fast and they'll duct tape it together and they'll get a Wookiee who will make sure it all runs, okay? And they will get it to go fast. And these folks are in our world, I'd like to introduce you. These are the developers. These are awfully kind of hipster developers. These probably do hang out in San Francisco maybe, I'd see some down in Stockholm. But they are uh, developers, okay? And all they want to do is run fast. And yes, now, again, because everything has to be code signed, they also have to deal with that too. There are some challenges though in this story. I don't know however many of you ever tried to sign code, uh, but most of the tools have been engineered for an individual uh, developer. And again, I have some of them here, and some of them are very good, including the one from, from DigiCert, for individual developers, okay? But if you take a look, and across all your different development platforms, whether it's Windows, whether that's iOS, whether that's Android, whether that's Java, you start throwing some new things here, which I didn't include. Wow, how are you going to get on the, the Docker uh, registry? How are you going to deal with signing containers? I mean, it's a lot of different tools. And in the hands of an individual developer who wants to just go fast, it's dangerous because they live in worlds like this. Okay? They don't live in the world of, you know, dealing with, you know, code signing tools that are generally engineered for an individual developer and they live in worlds like this really really high performance again, build, test, deploy environments really, really fast pipelines. And you put this in the hands of a developer who has to now deal with code signing, and when it comes to code signing, it kind of looks like this. You get a whole bunch of mix, a whole different cast of characters, who, again, you know, really, really don't want to sign code. And when I talk to some of the experts in DevOps, you know, some of the things that they see is that when they finally have to do the final build, They'll actually stop that really high performance build process, take the code away from that build process, and sign it. Which, you know, is actually kind of unfortunate because, again, you're trying to be in continuous deployment. You're trying to be fast. Now you're taking away code from that process. Um, so, which also then can then involve errors. Uh, and it's not really getting to the real mission that developers, DevOps want to succeed in. And so what are the, some of the things then that these new rebels, these developers, when it comes to code signing, what the heck are they thinking that looks a bit like that menagerie? Well, they're saying, hey, do we really need to sign this build at all? Maybe we don't need to. Uh, can we get some of that free let's encrypt? Does that work in code signing? No, it doesn't, um, but that's what they're thinking. Because uh, we see a lot of Let's Encrypt in some very, very large organizations uh, already when it comes to TLS. Uh, and then as well, wow, what should I do? What should I do with this, this, this key uh, that I just copy and pasted some bit of instructions on how to sign something? All right, so these are some of the questions that we see about these teams that want to go really, really fast but have to deal with signing code. You've probably seen them too. You might wonder then, a bit of a question, where is the security team in all of this? 
where are the people that usually we get to work with in, in this? Well, we see them, but there are not too many of them. If you're a DevOps sec environment, maybe there's 100 developers, maybe to one of you if you're lucky. That would be really, really good. So there are not many, again, security folks who are experts in code signing, who even can, can help the DevOps teams. And we start to see when we, when we do work with security teams and we talk to them about code signing, you know, they're starting to deal with a whole set of problems. So again, how do they, can they make it fast and easy for those developers to deal with signing code? How can we do that? How can I control who has, you know, privileges to sign code or not, whether that's a machine or a person? And you know what? Which certificates are supposed to be used to sign which code? We've got this project here that has this certificate. We use this certificate also for signing this code. Who has what? These are problems that security teams oftentimes get asked to physically put a person in place in large enterprises to have to deal with. And there are more problems. Again, like I can't control when and how codes, you know, code is now being signed. It's the developers now who are going to do it. And then, you know what, we do have a policy, but I can't enforce it. Those developers, they're doing it on their own. And again, I don't really know if our code should be trusted or not. These are serious questions that if we've faced some of the world's largest software developers, they're dealing with these problems. I mean, seriously, the, the applications that we run, even some of the security applications, these teams really don't know what to do in today's really fast development environment, and they're faced with these types of problems. So I do have some good news. And of course, PrimeKey's already had a great signing engine, and one of the things that, again, Venify is considered and considering, and we love your feedback, and Hari is gonna share some more with you, is how can we take that further? How can we help solve and bring a new hope for security and you know, fight back against the bad guys, help those rebels uh, go fast and, and keep really, really safe. And we think that the problems to solve for generally bucket into two areas. They involve into the I don't know types of problems, some of the ones you just saw. I don't know what people are doing. I don't know if I can enforce a policy. I don't know what they're using. Okay. And the second is then I can't control, especially in the high-speed uh, DevOps pipelines. I can't control. I, ha I can't even really help them in their pipelines uh, that need to go so fast, that work with Jenkins and other, other scenarios. Okay. So these are the two problems we think are at core to solve for. And they're probably then, again, then out of that come two core capabilities. One is to bring intelligence to the process. Let me give you some examples of what that looks like. And then two is to bring automation to that code signing pipeline. All right? So again, wow. We need to work with all the global CAs. So we need to have that intelligence to be able to work with the global CAs. We need to have that built in. We need to work with all code types. I mean, that's actually one of the strengths that PrimeKey has already developed. I need to work and be able to have support for all the major code signing formats. I need to be able to secure my keys. I need to have intelligence around how my keys are being secured. I need to be able to audit. I need to be able to actually, as a security team, I can't be there the hundreds of times or maybe even the thousands of times in some organizations when signing operations are performed a day. I got to be able to enforce my policy. Now, when it comes to be able to control, we need to be able to just integrate and automate into the developer's workflow, okay? And add that all, that whole build automation. And again, some of that spaghetti uh, that gets shown around uh, amongst uh, DevOps teams, we need to be able to, again, integrate with that. So if we can bring intelligence and we can bring control with automation, we think we've got a shot. And that's something that we want to get your feedback on. Now, Har is going to talk to you about a new prototype, which we think is as powerful as the Death Star, again, to help 
security teams to help developers actually get back in control and stay safe and go fast. So Har, you want to talk more about that? Sure, thanks. Always a tough act to follow. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so yes, as Kevin pointed out, can I use this thing? Good. Um, what we try to design within products at Vanify is around the personas. So we've identified a couple of personas here. Uh, one is the human user. These are the developers that, you know, today uh, will still try to go out and sign code by themselves. Um, what we're seeing is that population is starting to dwindle in comparison to machines, build systems, configuration management systems, et cetera, which is where code signing is kind of done not once or twice a day, but a couple of times an hour, uh, maybe even more than that. So that's two kinds of personas. Uh, there's two more on the other side, on the security side of the fence. Uh, one is the administrator persona, which is you know, the person responsible for making sure this whole thing is secure end to end. Right? And then there is the auditor persona, which needs to go out and figure out, OK, what happened? When did it happen? Did it happen in a policy conforming manner and things to that effect? So if you kind of step back a little bit, at a really high level, um, you know, there are three problems that we're trying to eliminate. One, direct access, abstract direct access to code signing keys by humans or machines. Because today, that's kind of the norm, um, and we want to make that the exception. There's always going to be cases where you, know, you can only sign code. For example, in the Apple ecosystem, they sign the code for you. right? But by and large, uh, what, one of the biggest reasons for things like Avast, which was a, a code signing event that happened uh, a couple of uh, days ago now, where uh, uh, malware kind of got stuck in with uh, the CC cleaner, disk cleaning software, if you would. So when you went out and installed that, it went out and installed malware for you. And that's because somebody got into the, the development process, uh, injected malware into what was otherwise a legitimate build. So they didn't actually steal the key, but they were able to compromise the code uh, signing process, if you would. So the idea is to kind of abstract direct access to code and instead have it be done centrally. And part of that is to make sure that your code signing keys are always stored within a secure environment, like in an HSM, right? So that kind of eliminates, or I would say, mitigates a lot of the risk associated with code signing credentials getting compromised. The other is the visibility aspect of things, right? You want to be able to enforce uh, policy, you want to be able to enforce workflow. Uh, when code gets signed for dev environments, you know, let it chain up under this PKI, right? Let it get signed, no need for approvals, no need for notification, let it just go through the process because you're in a dev or in a UAT environment. When, however, you want to push this into production, then it becomes a little more uh, you know, auditable. You want to be able to know, OK, who requested code be signed? Who approved that this code be signed? What else happened as part of the whole code signing process? You wanted to inject a scanning engine in there. You want to go out and intersect with a, uh, a network time protocol server. So these are all things that uh, we want to bring into a code signing platform, so to speak. There aren't a lot of enterprise-ready code signing platforms out there. Uh, and as Kevin pointed out, this is part of our core business, the idea of basically making sure we can generate keys securely, we can store them, we can orchestrate the movement of, uh, of keys around. And what we're doing with the code signing platform is actually abstracting the actual act of signing the code and doing that ourselves or on, on behalf of the enterprise. So the risk associated with code signing, some of these issues that we talked about, get mitigated uh, and significantly at that. Let me see if I can, there you go. So uh, what we're seeing here is two different experiences. The first experience is that for the, the developer. In this case, this is Alice, so I could call her Luke if you want. Just move ahead. Oh. Sorry, move ahead. Your slides are in here? Yeah, my slides are in, this is actually the browser though. Uh, well, then we're going to have to drag the browser over to the, the other display. There we go. Okay. Ooh, this is going to be tricky. Okay, so this is the, uh, the uh, developer interface. So in this particular case, uh, this is Alice. She needs to log in uh, to upload code that needs to get signed on her behalf. So today what she does is she basically requests access to the code signing key, uh, and then runs a bevy of tools, you know, sign key or uh, authenticode or, you know, different types of file types have different types of signing, uh, signing mechanisms. And in this particular case, we're trying to simplify her process and at the same time make it a more secure process. So when uh, she logs in, she has the ability to go out and request that code be signed. And in this particular case, you see that, you know, we anchor around the notion of a project. So as far as Alice is concerned, she has a couple of projects that she may 
be, uh, she may have the ability to request code be signed on behalf of. So if I drop this list down as Alice, I see that, okay, I've got uh, a dev environment, I've got a production environment, let me go click on the dev environment first. And then here it tells me, look, here's the kind of files that I'm allowed to sign, right? And I go ahead and click on browse and then say, okay, here's uh, an exe file. Um, and if I click on upload, what now happens as uh, Alice is that I get a view which says, okay, here's a new request that I've just made. It is pending approval. There's a couple of uh, things that have already signed or requested, some of which have been approved, some of which have been rejected. All right, kind of step back a little bit. What we're trying to do here is to make Alice's life as simple and as secure as possible. So all she needs to know is that, okay, I want to sign this type of file, and I want to sign this as part of this type of project. What actual file or what actual key gets used to sign that file is completely abstracted from her. She doesn't have any visibility, she doesn't have any know-how into what's actually going on at the back end, right? So the file gets uploaded, Venify takes care of signing, we're working with Prime Key on building this back end out so it can be as secure, as universally applicable uh, as possible. So that's kind of one scenario. There's another, um, I can help you hard. Here, just do this. Um, yeah. There you go. Now I lost it. Um, you can use the clicker. No, it's not that. It's the other interface. Yeah, use the force. <laughs> Okay, and here is the administrator interface. Uh, by the way, who knew the name of this character out here? Star Wars fans? Mon Mothma. Um, she was kind of a leader of the Jedi Council. Or not the Jedi, the Rebel Alliance, sorry. Um, so anyways, so here's the administrator yeah, interface. Uh, let me drag that back out. And uh, in here, I had, this is the Venify uh, portal today, so I have the ability to go in and say, okay, amongst all of the other things that I want to configure, I want to configure my code signing uh, projects. So as an administrator, I have the ability to go out and say, okay, here are my projects. I can go out and request a new project or create a new project if I want to. And the idea is every time a new type of file needs to get signed for a new type of environment, I have the ability to go out and create this. And what do I get when I create that? I have the ability to say, um, there is different kinds of things that I can configure. Um, I don't get to see the full screen here, but uh, in this particular case, I can name my project, I can figure out who's actually authorized to request file be signed um, as part of this project. So if you're part of the engineering organization and the PM organization, yes, you can request that a core file be uploaded. And then when that file gets uploaded, based on things like approvals and notifications, you have the ability to go out and say, you know, here is the actual key and certificate that I used to sign this uh, artifact, if you would, right? So in this case, my keys are on HSM, I just need to point to the certificate, and we'll go out and make sure we sign with the appropriate key, so to speak. So uh, that's kind of the administrator interface. Um, I have the ability to view things based on, you know, here are the different lines of businesses, for example, that, um, you know, I can use to, uh, or I can have visibility into who's been requesting code be signed, how many have they requested, what kind of traction are we getting, et cetera. So let me move this out of the way again and go back to my um, slideshow here. So um, to come back to, you know, the problems that we articulated, right? So there was the developer persona, basically their problem is, you know, I need to be able to sign code, I need to be able to sign it fast, and I need to be able to sign it easily. So in here, what we're saying is, we make it really, really simple for that persona. All they need to know is, okay, what environment am I requesting that code be signed on behalf of? I don't need to know what tool I need to use. I don't need to know, uh, you, know, what, um, you know, what key I need to use. This is all abstracted for me based on the fact that it's all tied into that project which my administrator says. Um, 
There is a, uh, another screen here which kind of tells me uh, at this point that you know, for this particular environment, I have these kind of files that are allowed. So that kind of gives the developer some sort of visibility into what can you actually request code be signed on, uh, on behalf of, and kind of eliminates a lot of the user errors where you're trying to sign something that you're just not all allowed to sign, so to speak. Uh, and then on the administrator side of things, there's a couple of problems. You, don't, you can't control uh, who should and uh, does sign code. You don't know what certificates are actually used to sign code, right? So here you have the ability to kind of layer intelligence on top of that. You get details on top of, you know, for, for every project here, you have the ability to say, okay, here's the kind of things that I can control as an administrator. Uh, for each project, I can also control, well, what kind of files do I want to sign? And how do people you know, inject code into the process? How do people get code out of the process? And that is all going to be configurable based on you know, how we're building this out. Right? So this is on a per project basis. And then from an auditor persona standpoint, the idea is I can't view when and how code was signed within my organization. And uh, you know, here we're giving them visibility into, OK, here's the different projects that you have. Here's what was requested as part of each, uh, each project. Here's who is authorized to actually request code be signed, et cetera. And I can't view if uh, you know, my code signing practices are, are actually conforming to my code signing policies. And that's where, again, I have a little bit of visibility into what was requested, what was approved, who requested it, who approved it, when did this happen, et cetera. Right? So, High level, uh, that's the uh, overview of the platform that we're building out. Uh, one key thing that I did want to stress out, again, is Vanify integrations are a big part of what we do. And though this may not be as visible based on how we talk through, I wanted to call it out here. There's a lot of integrations that are being built in. It's like integrations into code signing libraries, integrations into certification authorities, uh, into hardware security modules, into identity systems. So in our world, if you're part of the enterprise, you know, if you are part of a security group, that's what we use to kind of figure out who can sign what kind of file, right? So it's all built on either AD or LDAP, uh, if that's the way you want to choose. Uh, we're going to build integrations into both uh, IDEs and build systems so that, you know, as a developer, I need not have to log into a portal. It might be something that just gets plugged in as a, as a component with an Eclipse or as a, as a plug-in into Jenkins, if you would. We're going to integrate into time servers. We're going to integrate into scanning engines and things like that. And then one last thing I'd say here is the notion of code transparency. Dan talked about certificate transparency earlier today. But if you think about code signing as a process, it is ripe for something along the lines of cert transparency. Right? And the idea is, if I'm an organization that requested that code be signed and I've done this, I want to be able to assert to the trustworthiness of this code to my uh, clients, to my users, to my third parties, to my ecosystem. And what better than a code transparency initiative on this front, where there's nothing sensitive being advertised other than the fact that organization X signed code Y, right? And you've made it very, very visible for the rest of the, for the, rest of the ecosystem to kind of go out and trust and make decisions on. And conversely, you now know what the organization has signed, so anything that shows up with the organization's name on it, which is not on that transparency list is something that you can call out as potentially malicious, potentially something that you want to have additional uh, inspection into. So at a high level, that's the, that's the vision, uh, so to speak. And I'll let uh, Kevin wrap us up. So we're looking for your feedback. We're looking for you to hopefully join us. Again, we're looking to build upon the great capabilities that Sign Server already has, that, that code signing engine and building out this platform to solve the enterprise problems. So we would love your feedback. We're pretty happy about this. Uh, we hope that you'll join us. Again, I put up here Hari's uh, email address. Um, you can talk with either one of us. And, and we really want to get your feedback and uh, learn more what we should be doing uh, as we go ahead and as we partner with PrimeKey to, to build this out. Uh, over the next year. So we're really, really excited. Um, I guess any questions in the meantime about uh, what we've uh, worked on, about some of the things that you saw? Yeah, Harry. Harry. <laughs> Harry and Harry here. So is this actually using our sign server uh, in the background to do the code signing? Yes, it would be built upon a sign server, yes. And yeah. Is be using software. And so then you bring your, the customer bring their own HSM. That's right. Now we may again, as we get more feedback from the community, there may be the option to you know use the appliance. Uh, and the 
you know, a built-in HSM that comes along. But, you know, our customers, um, again, you know, some of the largest, you know, the banks, the, the retailers, they, insurance companies, they want to run this in their environment um, with the HSMs they, they already have. Yeah. Yeah. Up the down, down in front before you. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes, please. Yes. Mm. Right. So the problem there could be that the systems itself could be tampered and then made to sign, or you might have a developer unknowingly that submit things. And that's actually part of what we've considered as far as that, that, that build process is certainly, if you think about build processes, you have, uh, you know, um, code. Uh, inspection engines, you may send that out or parts of it out to the cloud. You may have, again, an automated system inspect that. So we would definitely expect to have that as that, that build process, that workflow automation, uh, to be able to validate that, yes, this is really code that I want to sign. And we think also that can be later on, and we didn't share that, that can really be the power of this platform too, not just to help protect the process, but actually then later in the future, actually should I even be really executing uh, this code? Did it follow that process? Was it in this protected environment? Yeah. Yeah. There? Yes, okay. Um, so the idea is to layer workflow, which we already have in the platform today in the context of uh, TLS certificate issuance. Right? So it's a very adaptable framework where you can say, if you're requesting this kind of action be taken, have these events follow up. And that could be a one of M uh, or a one of one kind of situation. That would include notifications, approvals, and things like that. So we would layer the same kind of logic on here where you would say, okay, as part of this particular project, because this is real serious stuff that goes into production, high value, you know, critical assets, Assets, you may want to go out and notify at least two or three people and require them to sign off on the process before you actually sign the code. Right? Uh, again, the goal is to kind of give customers as many tools as they need so that they can layer the right intelligence that makes the most sense for their environment. And then behind, I think if we have time, and then if do we, have, Karen, do we have time? We've got two questions. Oh, qu quick, quick, qu quickies, then please. <laughs> two quickies. Yes. <laughs> So it would be an additional, right, so it builds upon the Vanify platform that if you're already a Vanify customer, and some of you are, that you have and would build on top of that. Uh, and as Harry mentioned, leverages some of the capabilities. It would be an additional product then that you would license and add on to the platform. So it's a product that we're certainly really interested to have you ready to be licensed. Um, it's gonna take a, just a little bit of time to finish up. Uh, we've already done a great deal of work, but uh, if you're a Venify customer, if you're interested, we'd want to talk with you, though, uh, about when this could be available and, uh, and how it's shaping up. Yeah. And Dan. Yeah, I was curious, so you mentioned the CCleaner incident, and so uh, what kinds of malware checking are built into the service right now? So you've got the code signing operations that, that happen, but it, it sounds like maybe there's something that would be kind of like malware. So I think what we'd look to do in that workflow, that build process, so you've got static analysis, you've got uh, you know, various systems in the enterprise to analyze code. Um, so that's not something that Venify would bring at the equation. That's gonna be something really enterprises already have. We wouldn't be doing a better job at that. And that's where we have strengths in building up platforms that really integrate well into that. You know, already we've got a highly integrated workflow around TLS, around SSH keys and applying the same logic here uh, to code signing. Yeah, so we look to see, you know, whether it's a static analysis or adaptive or other, other types of methods, malware scanning already the enterprise has. We'll just build right into that, yep. All right, thank you all, it's great. I hope you'll join us on this journey. Thank you. Thank you.